Our first speaker, Brian Robotham, he is a tax partner at the Crow LLP. He has up the San Francisco Global Private Client Services Group, which provide the domestic and the international tax advice and compliance services to business and individuals operating in the US and abroad. Now, Brian has over 35 years of experience and currently advising the client doing business, including in the popular right now, the blockchain enterprises, esports, software gaming, for, for, foreign and domestic investment fund in real estate and the private equity funds, including the executives and their families with their assets and business interests in the US and abroad. He's also engaged to represent clients in the federal and state audit. Now today, Brian will cover situation that he encounters. So FYI, Brian's first start working with clients from Hong Kong in 1988. So we sure can hear a lot from him. Brian, will you please share some tax planning tips with our audience? Thanks, Harriet. Uh, happy to be part of this program. I wanted to say thanks very much to Michelle and Yanni. Uh, they really put a lot of effort out in putting this program together and also to the Hong Kong Association. Uh, it's a great organization and obviously spans the globe. Uh, hello to some good friends uh, and, and clients in Hong Kong that are actually tuning in. So uh, it's already tomorrow there. So uh, it's a kind of an interesting, I'm not sure which way the communications are going east or west, but I think we've got all, uh, the globe covered today. Uh, I'll talk about uh, situations we see. Uh, the, the title Tax Planning for International and Monthly National Families is huge because it really includes all the corporate, all the partnership, individual tax issues that come into play. And plus it's dealing with the international uh, environment. And, and just from a, a cautionary note, uh, the international tax area is unlike the domestic where there's a lot of logic continuity international there's coordination with the foreign elements too it's not just the u.s tax planning so lots of times the logic people might use for personal tax planning or uh, corporate or partnership for their companies or their investments uh, you have to sort of step out of the u.s box and just deal with a whole new area of tax laws and then also coordinate with people where the investments are, if people are coming from Asia or Europe. Uh, so our, the time we have is limited. So I'm gonna cover uh, five or six situations that probably apply to a lot of people that are on this call. And so hopefully hopefully they're relevant. And later on at one slide, I'll talk about Eric Ewan. If anybody knows Eric, uh, you should tell him uh, he's the founder of Zoom, uh, which we're all on. And uh, it's too late, Eric. Um, he, he was worth $2 billion at the beginning of the year, and now he's, I think, worth $16 billion. He should have talked to somebody on this panel uh, before he took off in value. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about pre-arrival strategy on one of the slides. Um, so, Yanni, we'll go to slide uh, Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Next slide. Um, okay, so we're dealing with uh, residency and, and what, what uh, allows or what qualifies a person for uh, US residency. Uh, it, there's a counting mechanism and uh, it's, it's sort of a before you're married and now you're married. It's a little bit like that in the US. Uh, there are two ways you can become a US resident. There's a formula which averages out to about four months a year, which is down in the middle of the slide. Uh, there's also getting a green card. And ultimately when you get a green card, you're basically a resident from the moment you set foot, you first set foot in the US. Uh, one of the things about entering the US and becoming a resident uh, up here at the top, I say uh, taxation and reporting. So the, the complex area sometimes is not the actual calculation, but they're under US rules, we have to report all our foreign investments, our financial assets, our, our bank accounts. And so that gets to be uh, a real burden. So a lot of people don't want US residency. They actually 
frequently expatriate because they don't want to deal with the uh, regulatory and, and the compliance and notification to the IRS. Um, some people have been stuck here because of COVID, but there's, there's a revenue procedure. It doesn't really help that much. Uh, it allows you, uh, if you see this formula in the middle, you, you, in the current year, if you had 120 days uh, plus a third of the prior and a sixth of the preceding, uh, they'll give you an extra 60 day window uh, in case you exceed 183 days. Uh, that's not much. So the COVID exception isn't going to help much. So anyway, just keep in mind, once you become a resident, worldwide uh, inclusion of income, and uh, even if it stays offshore or doesn't come to the U.S., and also reporting. Uh, so go to the next slide, uh, Annie. Okay. So uh, I understand a couple of people uh, listening in, they have EB-5 situation. So EB-5 is a visa classification when somebody wishes to invest, uh, immigrate to the U.S. and invest, in, they have to invest uh, in certain projects uh, for $500,000. It's to encourage investment into the U.S. So the U.S. will grant maybe 12,000 of these visas uh, annually. Uh, quite a few come from um, China's the largest and India, Hong Kong, North Korea. So same rules apply. Uh, they, the um, immigration services will grant a visa and upon entering the U.S., everybody becomes a resident. So what happens frequently, uh, the business owner could be the husband or wife. They frequently have to get back and go back to China uh, or Hong Kong and run the businesses. Uh, their, their, their wealth is usually in their country of origin, but they're still now stuck here. The kids are going to school. So these folks have two alternatives uh, in filing. And I have on the top on the right, the initial filing can just be a 1040, that's a regular return and worldwide reporting and disclosures. Uh, maybe if there are assets or investments in Hong Kong, the, the tax in China or, or Hong Kong will offset or reduce the US tax. Uh, there's a second alternative and it's an incredible alternative. Most people don't know about it. Uh, a person, if they're a green card and they've entered the US, uh, but they have to return to their country of origin, it's China, India or wherever, uh, they are actually more resident in, in that country of origin, but they have a US green card. If they're going back to a treaty country, they can actually file as a non-resident in the US. And why this is such a big opportunity is it means that they have a green card, the family's in the US, but if they're actually in their home country in a treaty country like China or substantial part and they're running their business or whatever back and forth coming to the US, filing a non-resident return means they can exclude all foreign income. And, and so it can save substantial amounts of tax. So people don't know about this very often. They say a green card, you're stuck. Well, that may not be the case. You can't do this with Hong Kong because still Hong Kong's a separate country. But for example, uh, any resident of China that immigrates to the US on an EB-5 visa or other L-1 visas, and they're here quite a while, uh, if they go back to China and are running a business or just there uh, for whatever reasons, and they have enough tests of residency in that country, they can file a non-resident return in the US. And just a quick uh, input, um, there's immigration implications, so you might have to check with your immigration uh, council on this. States. Um, just a warning, the states do not follow the US rules. Uh, they don't abide by tax treaties. So you have to basically just get input on uh, when you become a resident of whether it's New York or California, uh, et cetera. State rules do not follow federal. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so pre-arrival planning is huge. And so uh, what this slide basically points out is a, the typical structure we see, uh, it's either the first non-resident owning investments in uh, stocks and bonds, uh, foreign and US, or they have their assets held in a foreign holding company. Uh, that's the middle diagram where it says foreign hold co. Uh, a lot of foreign investors own their, their investments directly. And I don't know about other countries, but in the US, that's a problem. Uh, if you go down to the list of bullet points, the last point, uh, if 
someone sitting in Hong Kong or China and they own shares of Microsoft, Google, those are U.S. assets, and they are fully taxable in a U.S. estate tax. So we always worry about uh, estate tax exposure. And there's only a $60,000 exemption. So in most cases, when we have foreign clients investing in the U.S., we advise them to set up a foreign holco. Uh, it could be anywhere. It could be a Hong Kong company, a BVI company. It, can, it doesn't really matter. But it essentially insulates the non-resident from a state tax because a U.S. asset like uh, stocks, publicly traded or private, real estate, uh, those assets are subject to a state tax. And I've had situations where someone would die overseas and the bank would lock down their account and they would not transfer assets to the, um, the family until they had proven that they'd filed a return with the IRS, paid their estate tax, and then the, the bank will, or the brokerage firm will let go of the assets. So this is a huge mistake to overlook. Um, the big point of this slide, though, is when people are moving from offshore to the U.S. and they have assets held in a foreign holco, we advise people before you arrive, you can file an election, as is the third column. And the election, it's kind of interesting in the U.S., we can elect how to classify foreign entities offshore. So in the middle, we've got a foreign holco holding all the U.S. assets and foreign assets. If we elect to have that treated as a pass-through, uh, a disregard, like an LLC, in the U.S., before arrival, it treats that election as a liquidation of the foreign holco, and all the assets step up in basis to their fair value. It has no effect on the actual legal structure. It's just a tax election in the U.S. When you do that, you enter the U.S., and 100% of your assets are stepped up to fair value. Now that's huge because if you're holding stocks or other investments uh, globally outside the U.S., you enter the U.S. If you don't make this election, you don't have this. If you don't do this, uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Then, when you sell an asset in the U.S., uh, the gain is calculated all the way back to your original cost uh, compared to your selling price. So, this election is a really big deal for in incoming immigrants. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, this is a tough slide. <laughs> it took me a while to uh, try to make, make sense uh, so I could explain it. Uh, but we see this often where on the left, we have typical structure, Hong Kong family and U.S. family, um, both sides. And there's a Hong Kong company and uh, there's often real estate. It could be other technology companies or whatever. And at, at some point, um, the, the U.S. shareholders May, may control this Hong Kong company. Uh, some major tax reform occurred two years ago and the effect of the tax reform on this structure is that all the income in that Hong Kong limited company flows right through to those US shareholders currently and is taxed at 37% ordinary income. Uh, if, if the US shareholders uh, have more than 10% and those 10% owners uh, own more than 50%. So this is a disaster. Well, it's not a disaster. It just means that even though the monies are staying in Hong Kong, uh, while this is profitable, these U.S. shareholders have to start paying tax currently. Uh, they can pull the monies out and get a distribution of dividends, but again, they're taxed at the top rates. So uh, once again, if we have an opportunity to look at this before everything is set up or the business um, starts to generate income, uh, we, we would say to the U.S. shareholders, Hey, insert a U.S. Corp uh, as a second alternative shows. And under current law, this is the way a U.S. company would be taxed on its underlying profits in the Hong Kong company. Uh, current rate's only 21%, and there's a special 50% deduction. So the corporate tax now is only 10.5%. And the U.S. company gets to offset its share of the Hong Kong tax. So the U.S. company tax is zero. So the tax effect of that U.S. company sitting there is zero. Now, however, the dividends, profits can be paid right up through the U.S. company to the U.S. shareholders, and they're only taxed at 20%. So if you compare 37% on the left, and they're taxed currently with 
20% on the right, and they're only taxed uh, at the top when a dividend is distributed, it's a huge, huge benefit. You can keep the funds in the US company and not pay tax. So this is very complicated. I try to boil it down to two, two, two slides. Uh, let's go to the next, next slide. Uh, okay, conceptually, this is where uh, Eric Ewan blew it. He should have, uh, before he came, he tried to come to the US. It was an interesting story. Eight times he had to apply to get a, his visa to come to the US and he finally got here. And he, uh, he was at Cisco one day and he pitched the, the whole Zoom idea. He's an employee and they, they rejected it. So he, he um, left uh, Cisco and then set up Zoom. And now, now he's a multi, multi-billionaire. Well, he, he should have either used the foreign trust, uh, he should have set the foreign trust or US dynasty trust up for his family. Um, we had a situation where somebody was like him. Uh, uh, the individual pitched his a uh, good part of his stock back to his parents in Asia, in Taiwan in fact. Um, and uh, that stock exploded in value and now it's totally outside the estate. Um, so if, if you have individuals that are immigrating from Hong Kong to the US, and they're very entrepreneurial or they have a lot of wealth, they really need to consider uh, assigning out, they can gift things away. Uh, on the left bottom, there's some gifting uh, comments there. But ultimately, uh, before individuals like this come into the US or if they're gonna form tech companies, et cetera, they should really consider whether they should set up a foreign trust and the income in the foreign trust is not taxed in the US unless distributed to US beneficiaries or they could uh, set up a US dynasty trust. And generationally that money is never included in the US estates for US beneficiaries. So the foreign trust is very complicated and there's some rules about accumulating too much income and then distributing out prior year's income. So um, the, the foreign trust structure can work, but it's a little more complicated. But the US dynasty trust, we frequently bring that into play and it keeps all the assets under control in the family. It's taxed like an individual and forever outside the estate of, of the US beneficiaries. So I guess the answer is before your family moves over, uh, consider pitching your assets or wealth into a trust. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, so this is my uh, last slide, I think. Yeah. And so we, we frequently are advising people on from uh, Asia on buying real estate. And there's two ways to buy real estate, three ways uh, to hold real estate directly if you're a foreign owner, which is simple, in, but uh, there's a single level of tax. But if you look down at the bullet points, uh, there's exposure to 40, the 40% 40 uh, state tax. And again, only $60,000 exemption for foreign individuals owning uh, re U.S. real estate. So the other alternative is a corporate ownership where you have the foreign owners, a foreign hold co, and it, the foreign company owns the U.S. real estate. And this is often employed and the foreign corp, it protects uh, the non-resident beneficiary or non-resident owners from a state tax. So this is it's more complicated. You've got double tax, you've got, you've got corporate tax, you have individual tax at the top, but it does protect against uh, estate tax exposure. So uh, at times we see investment funds coming over from Asia investing in real estate, but they all go through a foreign court uh, in the real estate. And the, the third alternative, uh, I couldn't really get it all on this one little simple page. It's called a hybrid structure where ultimately we're setting up a couple of holding companies intermediate holding companies between the uh, foreign investors and the U.S. real estate. And the, these hybrid structures are passed through. So you only have a single level of tax, but because the holding structures are uh, resident operating and they have a foreign domicile, it has the, uh, the protection that the second corporate ownership structure has. So you get the best of uh, single level of tax pass through and protection from the 40% US estate tax. But it is a little more complicated. It doesn't fit in all circumstances. So uh, I think I'm close to my, my, 15, my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> so I will turn it back over to Harriet. And thanks to everybody for your time. And I'll be around for uh, Q&A.
Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very good summary of those uh, structure planning, have a few choices. So I'm sure our audience found them very helpful and informative. Uh, before we jump to um, Rex for other countries, um, I do have one question that seems like it's raised from one of your earlier slides, which is uh, slide number three, talking about for green card holders filing non-resident returns. And there's a question came up about regarding immigration council. So are you hinting that there's some issue here we should be aware of or some concern we should pay attention to? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, it, it ultimately isn't a problem, but when, when you apply for a green card, you're basically telling the uh, immigration service you intend to make the US your permanent home. And assuming you qualify, you get your green card. And, and so now you are maybe the business owner, you go back to Hong Kong or China, and um, now you're filing this non-resident return in, in the US, uh, which means that you're really more present in that other country, not the US. And so immigration counsel says, well, it's a worrisome thing when you file a non-resident return because you're sort of filing a return that's contrary to green card status. And so uh, there, there's some regulations in the immigration rules, but the long and the short of it is we have a huge number of people that have their green cards. They're really half time back in their country origin. The key is you're not gonna have problems with your green card because you file a non-resident return, which is absolutely permitted in the tax law, you will jeopardize your green card because you're not returning to the US, you don't have continuing ties. And if you have that problem and you're filing a non-resident return, uh, those add up and it's not a good picture, but the real jeopardy is not, not really the tax return filing, it's your lack of uh, returning to the U.S. at least a few, uh, two, maybe three times a year and having family or uh, just an ongoing uh, permanence that you can point to. So we always tell people, talk to your immigration counsel, we'll get on the phone. Uh, so everybody's agreed on this point. And, and so really, it's just getting good input from immigration counsel is not really a, a problem. Good idea, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, so for our audience, so as you said, no one should fit all. So with your specific situation, so please be reminded that you should consult and recommend to get input from experienced tax advisor before you in place your next tax structure. So thank you, Brian, again.